So we're back to Red Ox and a couple things uh, before we start. One is tomorrow's Tuesday and that is your guys' day um, where I get to sit back. Uh, so Juan commented that I was dressed as Leo again because it is still Red Ox um, or Leo Gurr. Uh, you guys can dress up as a mad scientist for your demo. I really have fun with your presentation. Um, and so you either in the 1130 group, the two o'clock group, or if you're in the evening group, we're at our normal time, six o'clock. Uh, I, yeah. Um, evening office hours, I can have them like at 530. If anybody needs me before the 1130, probably the two o'clock. Um, realize there's a group before you. And so if we get done early, but so if you come early and I'm not letting you in, it's that somebody's still talking. So that's just more. So if you're in the two o'clock group, just be patient. Um, Wednesday is review because Thursday is we're done like in three days. <laughs> it's like goes fast at this point. Um, so Thursday is our celebration three, which is thermodynamics and redox. And so Wednesday, I will do a review. I posted that today. Um, Wednesday also is the last lab, which is the QA3. Uh, so it is another flow chart. It is a bigger flow chart. So the first uh, QA1 had four steps. And then we did, sorry, this is QA2. QA3 was the one that was due Saturday. And I think that had six, seven steps. Um, and then this one has, I think, 10. So make a sketch first. Um, and then if you want to go over it with me, I have office hours today or Tuesday. So you, you're going to want to make a sketch of it because um, there is at the very, you want to make sure you start at a common point and then it comes down from there. And there's really two steps before you get a split. Um, and, and actually there's three steps because the first split ends up going in the trash can. So you'll get to show your artistic skills of the trash can. So your layout might not be starting perfectly in the center. You might have to start over because you end up, there's actually a lot of trash cans in this because there's a lot of places where you throw part of it away because it doesn't have anything. Um, but the, there's this first step where you have to adjust the pH. And that's actually really key because the rest of it won't work. And then once the pH is adjusted, then you do that next step. And then you centrifuge and you throw half of it out. And then you do another step. And then you centrifuge. And then you can finally split it. Um, and so you probably want to make a sketch to plan it out. Um, and you, you'll see. You'll get the idea. All right. Uh, and then today, worksheet and study set are due. Um, yeah. And Wednesday, we'll talk more. So tomorrow, it's all about you guys. Have fun with your demos. Uh, and then the lab, the report for your demos, um, there's a description on there. There's two parts to the report. So the one part is you like writing up instructions for somebody else how to do it. So there's going to be like an intro, which could be. Um, it really depends. Some of you are going to have a much more elaborate like intro and stuff because you don't have a lot of observations. So you'll want a really solid background and stuff of what the purpose is, uh, the procedure, um, post-lab questions. And then, of course, you write your lab report that goes with it. Um, so some people will have a more elaborate lab report because they have a lot of observations to report. And some people will have more elaborate first part. and um, all right, so let's do this. Uh, or oxidase, let's, let's do our equation. So we'll walk through this. Um, and I do this. We're going to do this the same way we did acidic. And then we're going to add another step. So the first four steps are the same as what we did last Thursday. So as a review, first thing we do is write our two half reactions. So we have the CN negative to the CNO. And one of the things that you'll notice right away, because it's in a basic situation, is there's a lot more oxygens. So we're going to see a lot of oxygens showing up here. 
Uh, and then our other half reaction has the manganese. I also want to do, as we go through the summary, more review of oxidation reduction, um, because having looked at your QA labs, we need to do some review of oxidation reduction. All right, now we go through the balancing. And again, the steps, we want to balance the elements ignoring the oxygens for right now. So we have a carbon and a nitrogen on each side, and we have a manganese on each side. So that's what that means. And then we balance the oxygens, and we balance the oxygens by adding water. So in our first equation, we have an oxygen on the product side, so we add water on the reactant side, and in, then we balance the hydrogens. So we have two hydrogens now, so two H's. Um, so we're assuming it's acidic, and then we'll neutralize in a bit. And then we have to balance the charge. So uh, Christian, this is kind of like the one you asked me before class. If What, what I do is I kind of look at the whole half reaction together. I see I have a negative on each side, so I ignore the CN and the CN negative. CNO negative because they cancel each other. So I just focus on the two hydrogens. Um, and so I'll need two electrons to balance the two hydrogens. The other way you can do it is look at the overall charge that the side has a negative one and the side would have a positive one. So the difference between negative one and positive one is two. The electrons will always go on the higher side because uh, electrons are negative. All right, our second half reaction, we have to balance the oxygen. So we have four and two, so I need two H2Os. So every H2O just has one oxygen. That's going to give me, so I have two oxygens plus two more. And then I have to balance four hydrogen. Um, yeah. And then we have to do the electrons. So my electrons are going to have to be on the reactant side, right? They're always different for the two half reactions. So this one's not as bad. On this side, I have no charge. It's, it's neutral overall on my product side. And on this side, I have a positive four and a negative one. So this four is not just for the H, it's for the positiveness of the H. So this is plus three. So I'll need three electrons. So questions up to that point. So I also forgot to write myself a note. It's a good thing I asked that. We're going to pause for a moment because I warned you of this, that the master of asking me questions major is actually under the knife right now during our class. So we'll take a moment, send major love for his knee that he has full recovery. And those of you in the two o'clock group tomorrow are going to get to see Major on narcotics doing his presentation. Um, but that means the pressure is on the rest of you. So please do ask questions today because it really does help everybody um, to when you ask questions. All right. So what's the next step? Uh, we need to try to increase, multiply the each side to balance the electrons? Yeah, the electrons, you have to gain and lose the same amount of electrons. The electrons always must cancel. Um, so the number of electrons is key because if you have them wrong, you start multiplying, it becomes kind of a nightmare. The one on the, the worksheet today really isn't that bad. This, the ones that we're doing together today are a little bit. Um, so the top equation, we're going to multiply by three. And this is where color can be helpful. And I don't actually erase. I cross out or write it above. So I'm going to have three waters, three cyanides, three uh, cyanates, six hydrogen ions, and six electrons. My second equation, we multiply by two. So again, six electrons, eight hydrogens two MNs on each side and four waters. All right, so this brings up something that happens on the worksheet. I mean, the worksheets are due after I lecture today. Uh, and that is, I, some, 
one person actually figured this out. Everybody else had to go back to the drawing table. So my electrons are going to cancel. Those have to cancel. That's the multiplication factor. Um, and then we're going to bring together the half reactions. But when we do that, you can also cancel out some waters. So I'll just kind of, um, and that does happen on the worksheet today. You're going to cancel some of the waters and some of the hydrogens. Um, so it, you can also end up, this does happen where the waters are on the same side. And so you would add them together. But in this case, I have four waters on the product over here and three here. So these three H2Os are going to cancel. And those four become a three H2O. All right. And then the hydrogens, same thing. I have six here. So those six cancel. And six would cancel from this, leaving me with two hydrogen ions. Questions? You're all missing major. One H2O? You had four and yes. you had three of them. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Captain Max. See, you must be feeling better. You can't smell anything, but you can think smarter than Leo apparently here. Um, yeah, so four minus three is not three. It is one. All right, let's bring these down. Um, and again, I mean, I wouldn't mark you wrong for this, but uh, traditionally we show the hydrogens or the water first and last. So, uh, and then the other pieces in between, and it doesn't matter what order, three cyanides, two permanganates, three CNO negatives, and two MNO2s and the water. Uh, so a quick check, because and before we do our next step, um, you can either check your oxygens. So I have eight, two times four. And over here I have three plus four, which is seven plus one more. So I have eight oxygens. So it's a quick check. And it's also worth it to check the charge. Um, so I have a plus two. I like too much. Um, oh, there's a pencil. Okay, right, I have a plus two, I have a minus three, and then I have a minus two. So right now I have a minus three on the side, and over here I have a minus three. So my charges are balanced. Um, if they're not, we want to go back to drawing board. So you want to do this with some way that you can erase because um, it's really nice because at the checkpoint, you know you've got it. So questions to that point, because we have another step. Right. So we have to, this is saying we have excess acid and it clearly states up here, it's in a basic situation. It's basic because that's where all the oxygens are coming from. Um, so the trick, there's all these tricks of ways to do it online. And, and to some people, they make sense. But this is the easiest way for me to teach, because to that point, it's all the same as just what we did before, is however many hydrogens you have, you have to neutralize them with hydroxide. So that's why it says neutralize the hydrogen. So we're going to add two hydroxides. But you can't just add to one side, because now it won't be balanced you have to add the hydroxides to both sides. So that's why it says add hydroxides. It should say to both sides. So that's, I'm gonna add the two hydroxides to balance the hydrogens. Oh, there's more. The, hy the hydroxides don't cancel the hydrogens. What are they gonna make? Water. They are, they're gonna make water. So however, lost my blue. These guys make two H2Os because there were two hydrogens and two hydroxides. This, this makes like a nice royal mess, right? Those two waters. Oh, we had a water on this side. So we have to reduce the waters. So we cross out that water. We reduce this one to one water and then we'll bring it down for our net reaction. 
which is that we have one water, H2O, three cyanides, the two MnO4s. And again, the worksheet today, so worksheet 12 is an acidic one, so you don't have to worry about this step. Um, and then the worksheet for Wednesday, which you can do today once we get through this, uh, three cyanates per manganate, no, MnO2, sorry, that's manganese four, uh, and two hydroxides. All right, we have to check now. So there's our final, and those charges were from a previous, the previous step. So you can check your oxygens or your hydrogens. Really, that's the only thing you have to check. So you have one, this would be two times four, so eight plus one. So I have nine oxygens. Now my product side, I have three plus four plus two. So three plus four plus two, right? So three here, two times two is four plus two more. So three plus four plus two is indeed nine. You can count them on your fingers. You should hopefully have enough fingers, I hope. And then we can check our charge. I have a negative three and a negative two. So I have negative five on this side, right? And then my product side, I have negative three and negative two from the hydroxide. So we're good. It worked out. So that's the good news about these is you get to the end and the charge checks out and either the hydrogens or oxygens, just pick one or the other, then you're good to go and you know you got it right. Um, it's more of the hot mess you become if it doesn't work out. And usually the best thing is to erase, take a deep breath, maybe go for a walk, do a different problem and then come back to it. Cause yeah, clear your mind, do the like erase thing. All right. Um, you can, I teach it this way, which is to neutralize at this point because it walks us through doing it acidic. You can also neutralize the half reactions, um, but the advantage of neutralizing once you bring it together is some of the hydrogens cancel, so it reduces the amount of neutralization you need. Um, here's our next one, and I'm gonna pause us and at least get through the acidic part. So split into your half reactions, balance the parts, doing it as if it's acidic, um, I'm going to pause us. All right. So make sure you always balance those other elements first. We had one nitrogen and one aluminum. Um, that's actually often the biggest mistake. All right. We have to balance the oxygens first. So you always do the oxygens before the hydrogen. Uh, it's two waters. That gives us, we have three plus four more hydrogens. So we're gonna need seven hydrogens for that equation. Uh, you can look at your charge. This one's not too bad. Uh, on the product side, we have, it's neutral, no charge overall. And on my reactant side, I have a plus seven minus one. So I have a plus six. So I'm going to need six electrons. All right. So the next one, I'm going to do it in pencil because then I'm going to erase. I'm going to do it the way I told you to do it. And I'm going to show you a different way. Um, you can do that you have this four means there's four oxygen. So you would have your four waters. And then here you have eight hydrogens. You need four hydrogens on the side because you have four times two. And over here, you already have four. So you'd need four. The reactant side has no charge right now. So my product side, I have a plus three. So I have, this is just a minus one for the whole compound and then four positives. So the coefficient, we do multiply. So we have a plus three. 
So I need three electrons there. Now, there is an alternative way you could have done that second reaction. And I'll just do it below. And, and there's probably one or two of you who are pondering, why didn't she just do this? I, I personally would have. Um, and, and this happens only occasionally that you could do this. And it has to do if the product or the reactant actually is a hydroxide um, rather than an oxygen. So if you notice, most of them are oxygen containing compounds. But on this one, we actually have a hydroxide that you could just have balanced with four hydroxides. Um, rather than trying to do oxygens and hydrogens. And it does end up working out in the end. The number of electrons, we would still need three electrons on the product side because I have a negative four here and a negative one here. So the number of electrons are not going to be affected. Um, it will come out the same. Four of these hydroxides would balance four of those hydrogens to make four waters. Um, and so you would have three hydroxides left over there. You can ponder all that. I'm going to erase it, though, and do it the way I was saying. Um, I mentioned that because I know, actually know who would do it that way. Such good erasers. Um, all right, so back to this one. We have the four hydrogens, three electrons. We're going to have to multiply this whole thing by two. So my four waters become eight waters two aluminums, two aluminum hydroxides, eight hydrogens, and six electrons, because the electrons must cancel. All right, your electrons cancel and some other stuff cancels. So see if I can do my math correctly this time, this advanced math. There are seven hydrogens and there's eight hydrogens. So these seven cancel, so you're left with one hydrogen on this side. It is worth it to write that one. You can get rid of it once you do your net one, but that way you realize you only have one. And then these two waters cancel, so we're left with six. Uh, a quick comment, you can end up with the waters and the hydrogens on the same side. That does happen. Um, Usually you have the waters on one side and the hydrogens or hydroxides on the opposite side, but not always. So um, don't start making rules up in your head. It just ends up laying out whoever it ends up. The waters, the hydrogens, the hydroxides are just there to make everything else balance out. All right, if we go to our overall, we have six waters left two aluminums, an NO2 negative, uh, going to NH3, two aluminum hydroxides. It does not matter the order you write them in, and a hydrogen ion. Um, it looks really, to me, it looks really weird because I would have done this one really different. Um, but we can check our oxygens. We have, I did it right. Uh, six, seven, eight oxygens. And over here I have four times two, so I have eight oxygens. So I'm good on my oxygens. And then for the charge, I have a negative one on this side. And on this side, I have a negative two and plus one, which is negative one. So I'm good so far. All right. Now we have to get rid of the hydrogen. So we add a hydroxide, but the key with the hydroxide step is you have to add it to both sides. The number of hydroxides is how many hydrogens you have. So again, this happens on worksheet 13 and on study set 13. So for Wednesday, you get some practice with these. These, I think these, these are, I don't know, they're kind of fun. Uh, this they don't cancel out, this becomes H2O. And over here, it's a hydroxide plus six H2Os. So our one H2O over here is going to cross out. And over here now, we have five H2Os. So this is a case where the water and the hydroxides end up on the same side.
All right. My dog is protecting me. Um, so five waters, hydroxide, two aluminum solids. So this is something some people were in my office hours. You've got to show state of matter. The ions, you don't have to. Those are aqueous. The ions have to have their charge because it's all about the charge. H2O, you can just write H2O because it's liquid in oxidation reduction. Uh, NH3 is probably gas, but it didn't actually tell us. But the aluminum solid, we do need to state that. That becomes important later on, but it is a good habit. And two aluminum hydroxides. Right. I know probably I'm driving several of you crazy because I have these random stray marks that you can ignore them. Have a good eraser for your pencil or your pad. Um, we check our oxygens. I have five, six, seven, eight. So I still have my eight oxygens. And over here, I have the four times two. So my oxygens are good. For the charge, I have a negative one and another negative one. So I have a negative two charge because the aluminum is a solid, no charge. And over here, I have two times the negative one. So my charge worked out. I was like something in my meditation today. I was I was laughing. I didn't feel stressed at all. I thought it was going to be funny. I was like, what if I messed up this? Because it's you can see it could be something because I get a videotape myself. Um, so we're going to go back and do oxidation reduction with these because that is the whole point. So these are the half reactions. You can see here, this is why they do the half reactions because once you get to the basic ones, uh, they become... It's a very systematic thing. Uh, believe it or not, students end up doing quite well with the basic ones. Start, master the acidic ones, what we did last week, what's on today's study set and worksheet. Feel comfortable with the ones that are just balancing and then um, the acidic ones. And then you just add the step. Worry about your demos first. We're gonna have a lot of fun tomorrow. I'm really excited. All right, we're gonna go through Leo Gur. Um, and by the way, I wore, I couldn't believe, I totally forgot my red ox shirt the other day, but to go with the whole outfit. So when I was in Nepal, they have shirts that say, yak, yak, Yeti. So Yeti is Sasquatch in Nepal, in the Himalayas. Uh, and so I got the guy to make me a yak, yak, red ox. And then the power went off. So I had to go back later. So they can make you anything there. All right, he said he understood the joke, but I don't see how he could. Um, so, top equation. What is, which equation is the Leo on up here? Which half reaction is the Leo half reaction? So Leo again is losing electrons. The top one. Yeah, the top one. So if the electrons are on the product side, that means you're losing them, like losing heat in exothermic. Uh, so my second one is my Gur equation, which means it's gaining electrons. You could come up with a new acronym too with Leo Gur because the gaining it's on the reactant side somehow. So the GER can mean gaining on reactant side is, so GER means reduced. LEO means oxidized. We went through this the other day, but there's more. Uh, you'll be asked actually, usually what element is oxidized or what element is reduced. Uh, so it is an element that changes. So this is a question a couple of people asked. So almost always hydrogen is a plus one. Um, so hydrogen gets to be a plus one if it's by itself as a hydrogen ion, if it's in water, 
um, if we see it in a compound, it's going to be a plus one oxidation number, which is called the oxidation state. So if you're asked, I asked this on the next lab, the oxidation state, um, but it's the same thing, the oxidation number. So the hydrogens are plus one. The exception to that would be if we end up with hydrogen gas. So H2, the diatomic, then it's a zero. But I don't think we've seen that, um, but we might. Even if you have more than one hydrogen, the hydrogen is plus one. So when you're asked the oxidation number, it's for each hydrogen, it's plus one. The oxygen is minus two almost always. It is definitely not an always. I talked about peroxide. Um, Sumner's, I think Sumner, your demo has hydrogen peroxide in it. That's why it works so well. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else gets to use hydrogen peroxide. But in hydrogen peroxide, oxygen is not negative two. And again, if it's O2 gas, it would be a zero state. In these equations, in the basic and acidic ones, the oxygen is almost always going to be negative two. In, in water, that's why water is so perfect. So we're going to do the other oxidation numbers because having looked at your quantitative, your qualitative analysis labs, some of you needed a little bit of help with that. So um, here with the CN negative, you can ignore the number in the front. Coefficient doesn't impact anything, but the charge we do need to look at. Uh, we have two elements. So anybody remember which one do we give an oxidation number to first and why in the CN? There's no oxygen there. The carbon. Oh, <laughs> it's a good guess. The one that's closer to the oxygen. So you give the greedy one its oxidation number first. And so it's based off of electronegativity. Fluorine's the most electronegative and then oxygen, and then nitrogen. So the oxidation number we assign is its normal oxidation number, which nitrogen would want to be a negative three. So its oxidation state or oxidation number is negative three. The carbon always takes one for the team. That's why carbon shares electrons so well. Um, it is not a plus three. Why is it not a plus three in this one? The overall charge is negative one. Yeah, we have a negative one. So when we add up our oxidation numbers, we have to end up at a negative one. So the carbon is a plus four. And I apologize. Usually I can erase my board. I could do this behind me. Um, all right, so the carbon's a plus four, nitrogen's negative three. When we look at this compound, for oxidation numbers, oh, we give the oxygen, it's negative two. The overall is going to come out as a negative one for everything. We're still left with two elements. The greedier one still gets to be greedy, meaning the nitrogen's negative three. So Please realize these are oxidation numbers. They are not the same as a charge. We assign them as charges, the numbers. All it's telling us, it's a prediction for chemists, for chemical reactions, for a change in potential to say, where are the electrons moving to? Um, it's not quite the same as like when we say sodium's plus one and chloride's a minus one, but it's, it's a similar. All right, so then the carbon is going to be what here? Plus six. It ends up having to take all that positive from the oxygen and the nitrogen and, I'm sorry, plus, yeah. You know what? You're wrong. This is not a plus four. This one's a plus four, Damon. I was looking, this is plus two. So plus four and a minus three would make a plus one. <laughs> and that's what I was confused about. I'm throwing Damon under the bus here, but it's actually me who should be thrown under the bus. Um, I, I just, you know, been in a state of disbelief of what's going on in the world and that I might be stuck on Zoom forever and ever and ever. And 
how long it will take me to become madder than a hatter. Um, mercury poisoning might be easier, right? So this one, it is plus two, and the minus three would give us a negative one. Da nobody can see it. Damon's laughing like I am too, because um, there were some people, there's several people who send me like emails over the weekend say, hey, can you look at my worksheet? And I'm like, I could if you sent it to me. And they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. So you see what I go through like all the time. That it's, it's so fun because we're recording it. So the carbon starts at a plus two and over here it's going to be a plus four. So when you add them up, you end up at negative one. So plus two and minus three is minus one and plus four minus three minus two is minus one. So yeah, all right. I'm going to ponder. I was about to write Damon's name on the board for the bonus point, but it's like. <laughs> That's fair. I know. I think my name, I have like negative points in the class by this time. Anyway, so the carbon's oxidation number. So going back to Leo Gur, the carbon is what's oxidized. It is an element that changes. And it's the carbon that made a change. I was going to say a plus six is so rare to get a number that high. Um, they, they don't want to be that big of a difference. But all right. Uh, for the reduced, it's going to be, it's not usually the hydrogens or the oxygens. So we can take a guess that it must be the MN. And we're going to go through the step. So what's manganese oxidation number in the permanganate? Well, what's oxygen? Oxygen gets to be negative two. Each oxygen is negative two. There's four of them. So that gives me a negative eight. But when I add them all up, because I didn't do my little math table underneath, Damon. That's why you were confused. You were doing the shortcut like your teacher was, and we both failed that one. Um, but we're giggling. And so the manganese is a plus 7. So positive 7 minus 8 is negative 1. So the manganese is a plus 8. I'm sorry, plus 7. That's actually why it's called permanganate, because the Per is actually anytime we see the per, the element that is with the oxygen is in a plus seven or a plus eight. They're highly reactive because they have so many oxygens combined with them. Over here, this one's pretty simple. The oxygens are still minus two. There's two of them. So the permanganate is a plus four. I'm sorry, the manganate, manganese is a plus four. Um, so we're going from a seven to a four. It's oxidation number decreased, it's gaining electrons. And it's fascinating because it is the um, metal that's gaining the electron and the non-metal that was losing. So in biochemistry, there's actually a much easier way to answer this whole question. Oxidized means that it actually gains oxygens. It makes sense. It was before they knew about electrons. And that's where the word came from. And if you look, it's gained an oxygen. So in organic and biochemistry, we just look for the oxygens. Anybody want to guess what the word reduced means? It means you reduce the number of oxygens. So manganese had four oxygens, and now it has only two. So that's actually where the terms came from, is oxidized meant you were you were picking up some oxygens and reduced meant you're reducing the number of oxygens. So for those who go into organic and biochem, it's actually much easier. And nutrition, actually, that's where all the terms of oxidation and stuff, they just don't ever use reduction. They say oxidation and antioxidized. Um, there's also another trick with hydrogens, but we won't go there. All right, the other piece that I didn't talk about the other day, I don't, maybe I did, but um, so oxidized is going to be an element that is, its, it's number is going to increase. You're going to see an increase in the oxidation number. So the carbon went from plus two to a plus four because it's losing electrons. So the element that loses electrons. 
as you move forward, so you're going always from reactant to product, the oxidizing agent is always the other reactant. So the other reactant. The agent causes oxidation to happen. It is not oxidized. So the OA causes the oxidation. OA stands for oxidizing agent. It will be written out as a full word, usually. So it, if it causes oxidation, it is going to contain the element that was reduced. And it must be a reactant because that word agent is implying it's something that's causing. So up here, the oxidizing agent is the MnO4. Something with lots of oxygens causes oxidation to happen because it's going to give its oxygens to them. That's where all the terminology came from. Oxidizing agent is something that gave things oxygen. So MnO4 has too many oxygens. Uh, perchloric acid, uh, sulfuric acid, and nitric acid, they have lots of oxygens. They, are, they get like double, triple placards because they're strong acids. So they're extremely dangerous to work with because they're going to burn the heck out of you. And they're really strong oxidizing agents. So they're actually used for both things in the lab. And so there's always great caution with them um, when you have them. All right. There's a lot of words, but it was just from, I don't know, the reducing agent then would be the CN negative would be my reducing agent. All right, on our second equation, our, um, sorry, yeah, the NO2 and the NH3, so that is gaining electrons. So this is my reduction half reaction. That must mean that the nitrogen is what is reduced. Almost always, it's going to be whatever was with the oxygens. And you can see it's, it, it's reduced because it's losing oxygens. Oxidation number, here it's with hydrogen, so it was negative three. Ammonia makes sense. Here it's with oxygens, so it's a plus three. So it changed from plus three to a minus three. If it is reduced, what agent? Whatever my gaining electrons reduction contains the oxidizing agent. So my oxidizing agent is the NO2 negative. They always flip-flop. Do the leo -Gur first, and then you can flip-flop. Or you can just be like, I'm just going to do the leo -Gur and not worry about the other point. Um, so this was this is my Leo. This is losing. This is oxidized. And that would mean the aluminum. So if it's oxidized, the aluminum, the reducing agent is the aluminum solid. So this is my oxidizing agent. This is my reducing agent. That was kind of a messy review of it. We'll see it in actually the study sets today and tomorrow. We have like almost a whole page where we walk through the half reactions. Um, Always do whatever one's losing the electron, right? They were on the product side. That's your oxidized. And then you flip-flop. The other one's your oxidizing agent. All right. We're going to add one more step. Which is the cathode and which is the anode? Oxidation always happens at what electrode? The anode. Anode is always oxidation. Always. Even today when we change the rules. The cathode is always reduction. So you could do that up there. We're in, I'm going to draw the picture on the next page, or we drew a picture the other day, but we can do it of this one. Um, 
actually, let me see if in our examples. Um, we'll do it with this one because it's a little less messy. So we have the copper ion going, because this will also help me to point out some things from the worksheet. So for people who do their worksheets early, I'm very grateful because then I know what are the common mistakes for everybody. Um, that's the copper ion is going to copper solid. Um, so in, and then the other one is the zinc solid is going to zinc ion plus the two electrons. Um, in, on the worksheet, I give you the half reactions and I ask you to put it together to get to this. Please notice in the overall equation, you must show your ions, you must show your solids. And one of the equations got flipped. So we're gonna actually, with this one, do a quick review of the chart that's at the end of your notes. Um, so the copper equation is up here and the zinc equation was down here. All these equations show plus electrons. So all of these equations are reductions. One of them has to be an oxidation. Whatever one is the lower one is gonna be the one that you flip. Um, and I actually had already done that for you. When you flip them, what happens? The sign of the volt changes. Yeah, so the only thing that changes is the voltage sign. We don't double the voltage. We just have the electrons on this one canceled, no problem. The copper was a positive 0.337. Uh, and then we just add them up. So whichever one you end up flipping. This one, I actually had given you the equation already because this is the page before we learned how to do that. If I don't give you the equation and I say make it into a battery, then you always flip the lower one. So on the quiz, on the worksheet today, I just give you two, the lower one you flip um, and then you have to put them together and you have to make the electrons cancel out. You have to show your solids and yeah. All right, here's our net equation. But having the half reactions is important because our copper, is our copper gaining or losing? Gaining. It is gaining. So this is my GER. That means is it the cathode or the anode, Damon? Get your name back up there since nobody else is answering. Reduction is the cathode. Yeah. And so our other one is our Leo or oxidation. Again, you can write it as Leo GER or you can write oxidize reduce, and that's going to be our anode. Um, another question that came up is I ask about polarity. So just a reminder, these are the electrodes are the metals. So it's going to be the copper and the zinc, the solid. If, which is going to happen in a few in, in the next hour in our notes, if you have a reaction that like the ones, the messy things we just did, um, this half reaction, the NO2. NH3, there's no metal there, then you use a platinum. Um, platinum is not reactive. It's, it's not gonna be on the charts. And so platinum is extremely valuable to chemists. And then people make it into jewelry. Fascinating to me. Um, all right, so you can make it as one big cell if you prefer, or you can do it as two separate like that. If you make it as one big, you have to put separate them. That's actually key. And then write your half reaction at the bottom of them. It doesn't matter which reaction goes in which side. All right, so my copper is going to be my cathode. Um, so that's my copper. And the cathode 
in electrochemical is positive called polarity. I don't know why, it's just what they did. The zinc in this case is the anode. So it's negative. Cathode again is gaining electrons. So when you make your wire to connect them, I'm going to make my wire go down around. You have to show the electrons flowing. They always flow to the cathode. All right, so it's not gonna work. Why, what am I missing? Bridge. Yeah, you need a bridge. And so you need the circuit to completely go around. I'm gonna make a tunnel. I grew up in New Jersey, so there's the only way you can get into New York City is you go through tunnels. Um, so there's a joke. So you may know the joke about New Jersey. So you never pay to come into New Jersey, but you have to pay a fee to leave. Um, so all the bridges from New Jersey go to Philadelphia or New York City, and they don't want the traffic backing up in the big city. So when you leave the big cities, you're coming into New Jersey, so they don't pay a toll, but you pay a $20 toll whenever you leave the state. Anyway. Uh, and so our anions are going to flow to the anode. And you can have a lot of fun. A couple of people turned in their worksheets and they made amazing bridges. I was really impressed. Or if you want, you can make a cat for Rocky. And Rocky is our cat ions. Uh, since cats are positive, they would flow to the cathode which is positive. So you have a choice. You can do anions, cations. All right, questions with the battery. And have fun. I was quite impressed. You know, every bonus point counts at this point. We're in the last week. Get all the bonus points. We're going to put Damon on the board because he's kept his camera on too. He should get double points for taking one for the team there. All right, so, oh, so these are called electrochemical. These are batteries, electrochemical. I highlighted that the other day, uh, voltaic, galvanic. The key with them is right up here. They are spontaneous. The E is positive. Delta G is negative. K is greater than one. All right, so we're gonna do math. Um, here's one of the equations. Delta G equals negative NFE. That's a way if you have the E, you just plug in. A couple things with that, Faraday's constant. That was our number. We're going to use it a lot today. That's coulombs per electron. Uh, the big chart is in volts, and a volt is a joule per coulomb. So you're going to be in joules, so I always add that extra step. And the N is what? tells us it's the moles of the electrons. So in the question that we just did, if we were gonna do it with this, that would be the two electrons. All right. So we are on page, do that, get rid of four pages. We're on page 55. And the first thing wants you to use the chart so that this means you're going to be looking at the chart. You can write your half reactions. Um, this now means we're going to use this formula that's up here. The E equals E naught minus 0 0.0257 over the N times the natural log of Q. So Q again is products over reactants. So for this equation, Q is so, Paul, this is the question you were asking me, and this goes back to the first day of class. We're talking about equilibrium. We ignore the solid and the liquid. They have to be there for your overall equation to figure out your electrons. But when we write our Q expression, we just are going to show anything that's an ion, aqueous, 
anything that's a gas, so mercury. Uh, and the silver ion, you have to square it. So be careful about the coefficient. So products over reactants. So it's going to be our Q using the numbers that I gave you. If I state, which I do, I know on the study set, uh, assume everything else is standard. That just means everything else is a one. So we ignore that. Um, so products over reactants. And again, you figure out your electrons. Um, the delta, the K. So I showed this to the evening group. You can use the delta G equals negative NFE and then use, I'm going to give you two different ways you can find K. You can do the delta G equals negative RT, natural log of K. So that's one way, right? Plugging in the delta G. You can also use this equation. You set that side equal to zero. So you end up with E naught. This is, these are all at the, um, using, assuming everything is standard, equals 0 0.0257 over the N times the natural log of K. So either one of those will work. There is no negative here. The negative disappears in doing that. So I'm going to pause us. You take a five minute break. Uh, we're going to just go through one, two, and three, and then we'll move on to electrolysis. That's what I want. All right, let's go ahead and walk through this. So there's our chart from our notes. There's bigger charts online, but we're going to go with this chart to make sure we all have the same numbers and it's simple. Um, so if I give you the equation, you can end up with a negative. So the equation, we have the silver. Sorry. <laughs> Nobody's home and somebody just knocked on my door. And my dog's sitting there looking at me, so I'm confused. All right. Um, so the silver is here, and the silver did not flip, so it's a positive 0 0.80 volts. Uh, and then the mercury is right above it. And the mercury is the one that flipped, so it becomes a negative 0 0.855 volts. So again, if I give you the equation, you have to go with how I gave it to you. So you can get a positive or a negative. Now from this, the fact that we have a negative, it's non-spontaneous. And so I did this one on purpose to point that out. It's non-spontaneous, meaning this is not going to work as a battery. So it's not, not a battery. The opposite would be. Um, so on step B, we're going to see if we can manipulate the components, how much we have in there, and a prediction we can make. I mean, one, I know what the answer is, but I the biggest change is the mercury ion, which is on the product side. So by decreasing the mercury ion, it shifts, right? The shift goes forward. And so we should see an increase in E, and we actually will see a significant increase to actually make it spontaneous. So if you lower one of the products enough, um, it has to be the one that's the ion. So we plug in, this is always state your formula. So again, good job, keep doing it. because We have lots of formulas here, and then we plug in. Um, the one thing though is a lot of you are getting slack on units. So please show your units. It makes a big difference, especially in the thermodynamic stuff. Uh, our E naught was the one we just calculated from the chart, 0 0.055 volts. And then the 0 0.0257, the number of electrons, two is a really common number, but the mercury went from a zero to a two, or there were two silvers. Each silver changed by one, so that's our two electrons. The 0 0.0257 again comes from the R, and we're using the 8.314 R times standard temperature. Anybody remember? It was a whole week ago. 273, 273 no. K? 
No, that's a gaff loss. Oh. Here it's 298. 298. Yeah. So actually, thank you for that. Um, yeah, gas laws for some reason are the weird one that it's zero degrees Celsius. This is actually a really warm room. And then Faraday's constant. Um, yeah. And then natural log Q is going to be the mercury over the silver. So 0 0.001 over the 0 0.8 squared. And that's where I got my answer from. You don't have to show the positive, but I do to emphasize it. So we were able to shift it forward. When I asked the question to explain why it makes sense, uh, if we've changed some concentration, that's what I'm looking for. So if you change a reactant, if we decrease the silver ion, it would have shifted reverse, which we wouldn't have wanted. All right, the next one, um, you have a choice. You can use either of those formulas. You can go ahead and use the E one since we have E naught. Which, uh, just be careful that you use the E naught. So the negative, I'm using this one, uh, 0 0.055 volts. This point, it can be really helpful to show your unit is right joules per coulomb. Uh, we're going to have to multiply by the n, the two electrons, and divide by the 0 0.0257. And it's a natural log, so we would do e to the power of this whole thing. And we get a k. It makes sense. This k is less than 1. My delta g is negative means non-spontaneous. Similar idea for this, negative two electrons. Faraday's constant, that is actually how the F is written. Uh, you can write it as a block F, but I think it was major the other day. He was like, what is that? Um, so 96,500, and that is coulombs per electron. And then times our E which is the negative 0 0.055. That is joules per coulomb. So then to go to kilojoules, divide by a thousand joules to one kilojoule. And I got 11 kilojoules. So this negative and this negative will cancel. And so that all makes sense. So for this one, we got a negative E, a K that was less than one and a positive delta G. So that's the other question. Those all go together. Do all of them go together? Yes. They all are saying it's reactant favored. Non-spontaneous means reactant favored. And again, Wednesday, good, I'm recording. <laughs> um, Wednesday, we'll be reviewing all of this, going through all of it. And then this evening, and Wednesday evening, our last study sets, I'll be going through. Um, all right. So our next one, the hydrogen standard cell is zero and the zinc is the lower down one. So when we add up our two half reactions, uh, we do get a positive for our E from the chart or E net or E cell. Um, again, that's actually what the technical name is. So spontaneous, that's great. If you were asked to predict, then delta G would be negative, K would be greater than one. All right. Um, so we're using this formula, stating our formula e equals E naught minus 0 0.0257 over N times natural log. And you don't have to say Q. Instead of saying natural log of Q every time, let's say what it is for this one, which is the zinc ion products times the hydrogen gas. We do have to factor in that gases. And then the hydrogen ion is squared. So that's my Q expression. And then I would plug in. Now, if you want, you can ignore the hydrogen because it's one and we can ignore the zinc. They're both one. So we'll have 0.763 volts. You can show the positive if that helps you. You can put the zero in front of the decimal if that helps you. 
uh, minus 0 0.0257. All right, we need N. How many electrons? Looks like two, because the zinc. Yeah, two is, if, you really, if you're really struggling, go with two. But it's not always two. We had a six the other day, and three show up. All right, and then times the natural log. Uh, it will be one on top, and the hydrogen is our unknown. So it's not x, it's x squared. All right. Uh, so half of you do the solve function, the other half, we're going to, I actually, we knew the E. I gave you E. E was 0.45. So this whole thing, we set up equal to this 0 0.45. So to do the math, you'll subtract the 0 0.73 because this is a separate term. And then we'll move this piece over by multiplying by negative two and dividing by the 0 0.0257. And then you'd have to take e to the whole power of that. And then you have to flip it because that will give us one over x squared. And then you have to take the square root. And then once you find x, x will equal the hydrogen we would do the negative log of x, and you should get that pH. So that doesn't, I don't think that shows up today, but that's what we would do with it, is rearranging. Um, just in the interest of time today, I'm going to keep going. If you're struggling with how to do all this algebra, I didn't give myself enough room, which means a lot of you, I didn't give enough room. Um, we can walk through it step by step. I, I'm pretty sure on the study set for Wednesday, we run into one of those. On B, it is calculating the E, so we would just plug in our E point, our E naught is still the 0 0.073, but that 0.45 was given to you, um, minus 0 0.0257 over 2. And then natural log, the zinc and the hydrogen are still one and 10 to the negative pH. And then we would square that. So just a reminder, that's just 10 to the negative pH. You can just write it like that and then you square that number and take the natural log of one over that number, plug that all in. And that should be our answer. So at least write down what the answers are and then make sure I would recommend going back through both of these problems so you feel comfortable with them and um, All right. Any questions? So here's a question for you all. What is standard pH? Hello? Nope. It's zero. It is zero. Why? Because at standard conditions, the concentration of hydronium is um, one. Yeah. A negative log of one is negative zero. So, or zero. B plus or minus zero. Um, so to explain this one, why the answer makes sense, if we look, we have a lower E. And that lower E is because it's shifted reverse. This is the backward reasoning that I'm warning you all of. I think it's better to do it like this to say what happened first, but that lower E means that the shift must have been reversed. The shift must have been reversed because of a change in the hydrogen ion, which is we must have had a lower hydrogen ion. So this is due to a lower hydrogen ion, which results in a higher pH. And we're seeing a higher pH. 
All right. Same thing happens on this one. We have a higher pH. Our E is going to end up lower than what our original E in the chart was. There's another one there. I'd have to find the answer key. I don't have that right now. We're going to talk about electrolysis, though, for this last bit of class. Electrolysis is non spontaneous, which means our E is going to be what? Less than zero? Yeah, it's going to be negative. Um, so this is, we have to force the reaction. So you have to put in electrical engine energy, you have to plug it in. This is the recharging of your battery. All right, so a quick compare, well, let's draw it. A comparison, electrolysis, one cell. Electrochemical, there's always two cells. They have to be separated. So if there's one cell, there's no bridge. Whereas in the two cells, we had to have that bridge. Now, something that is always going to be the same is the cathode is always reduction. The anode is always oxidation. So for both of them, the cathode is reduction. The other thing is the cations flow to the cathode. You can then say the same thing, right? The anode. The anions move to the anode, but it's very different why what's happening. So if reduction means gaining electrons, that means that the electrons flow to the cathode, always. What is the difference about the electron movement, though? The electrons are always moving to the cathode. That's the definition. Is in the electrochemical, it is spontaneous. And so because of that, the cathode gets to be positive. In electrolysis, it is forced because you have to plug it in. And so the cathode is now negative. So the big difference is the non-spontaneous and the change in polarity and the fact that it's one cell, but it's really the big difference is it's non-spontaneous. So if we want, we can put our cathode here. Oh my gosh. Yeah, uh, and our anode. And we'll do this one. So molten means it's pure. It's a liquid. And that's actually important because of this little blurb I have here. So basically, if it's aqueous and you're running electricity through it, you're going to cause something to happen to the water. Um, and so on your chart, where's the water? Here we go. No. Anything that is above this on the chart, if water is present, you can't do them by electrolysis because the water needs less energy. So remember, we're doing everything backwards now. So all of these are going to need a lot more energy. So they don't work. Um, you know, the books usually have a big deal about this. 
And down here, here's our water. So as ions, these aren't going to work in the presence of water. There's actually a, a thing that talks about, but there's a thing. Um, and so you have to have it as a molten form in the pure liquid and um, running the electricity through. Uh, I usually use the ones that are somewhere in the middle so we don't have to worry as much about it. Um, there is a weird thing, the chlorine. There is something that happens up here though and it actually bumps it, um, which is beyond what we need to worry about. But this was, this was all done by Sir Humphrey Davies. Um, once they figured out how to have batteries and a flow of things. Uh, our cathode, we can't make it out of sodium metal, so we're going to make it out of platinum. And we definitely can't make it out of bromide. Uh, the cathode we would now say is negative. The anode is now positive. There is still going to be a wire that connects them. The electrons are still going to flow to the cathode, but the difference is you're going to have a socket in the wall and you're going to have to plug it into the wall. You guys can probably draw. What I have seen is the students draw a much better plug in the wall, but that's me plugging it. You have to plug it in. So the electrons are being forced from the electricity in your wall. This is how you recharge your cell phone. Um, what would be happening here is if we were dealing with sodium bromide, the reaction that's happening at the cathode is that sodium ion is gaining an electron and becoming sodium metal. And so at this electrode, you actually have that reaction happening that the sodium ion is being attracted to the cathode where it's picking up an electron and becoming sodium metal. And this is how Humphrey Davies was able to make most of the 1As and 2As was um, figuring this out. He used to do these elaborate like demos for the public. He'd have um, lectures like every Friday or Saturday night and people would come like all dressed up. This is in England, in London. Uh, our other end would be the bromine or the bromide going to bromine. Um, we would need two and two electrons. Bromine's liquid. All right, so the two bromides are going to lose their electrons uh, and become bromine liquid. So that's the idea. They're not separated. So in here, you basically have a whole bunch of sodium and bromide ions just floating around. So again, the term ion, I think it may have actually. I don't know who coined it, but anyway, it's for Io who is a meanderer. So the ions are floating around in here and the cations get attracted to the cathode and you end up with the elemental states of um, the whole point of electrolysis is that you're making the elements. So you're going from ions to an element, solid, liquid, or gas. Probably one of the most missed things on the last celebration, our third celebration, because you have been trained for three terms for your whole year, your chemistry, that they all react to become sodium chloride or sodium bromide. So you would react the sodium and the bromide. We're doing the opposite because we're suddenly throwing electricity into this whole thing. Again, there's no bridge because you just have this mix and the cations just naturally go to the cathode, pick up their electrons. The anions go to the anode and give up electrons and they go back to becoming elements. Um, all right. On the last worksheet, you get to draw one of these for something. I know you get these. Um, 
All right. So we're going to do some calculations. That's Michael Faraday. Um, and so that's who the constant, Faraday's constant, is named after. And again, I commented he was extremely humble, uh, no education at all, was pretty much living on the streets, working as a bookbinder, read all of Sir Humphrey, taught himself to read by being a bookbinder, and read all of Sir Humphrey Davies writings and stuff and somehow got himself a job working in with Sir Humphrey Davies uh, and then it went from there and so he's a guy who's credited with I don't know if you say developing inventing figuring out electricity um, and this is the constant that we've already seen we're going to be doing these as factor label so for those of you who've struggled for your whole career of chemistry with that uh, sometimes this actually starts making sense. Uh, and then when you take it in physics, you do it with the algebraic way. We're going to be using amps and, and volts is usually what we do. Um, I think I have one problem with uh, watts on here. But an amp, amp is a flow. It's the rate of flow of the charge. So Coulomb is the measurement of the charge. So it's the flowing of the charge per second uh, is what an amp is. A volt is joules per coulomb, and a watt is the amount of work. So when you do it in physics, you usually learn that, that amps times volts equal watts, and you rearrange that way. We're going to do it, though, with the periodic table, and we're going to calculate how many grams of aluminum is our question if we have one hour and this many amps running through with our electrolysis through our solution that's aluminum chloride. So the solution's aluminum chloride. So the aluminum is going to get plated at the cation, and the chloride is going to make chlorine gas, which is not a good thing. It's going to knock the guy out. But start with the time. We're solving for grams. You can show these as individual little steps. Um, let's draw a little heart. There's nothing underneath the hours. Amps is always per second. So how many seconds are in an hour? 3,600. Yes. Sorry, I was looking for my marker. You can do 60 minutes in an hour or 3,600 seconds per hour. And then how the amp factors in here is we say there's 10 amps per second. I'm sorry, 10 coulombs per second. That's 10 amps. So an amp again is a coulomb per second. And so our seconds have canceled and our hours have canceled. So this is the whole thing with factor label. You take the unit, you pull it down, we go to seconds. We pull the seconds down, we go to coulombs. I need to get to grams of aluminum. And this is where that conversion, pretty much use it in every single one of these. So 96,500 coulombs is one mole of electron. Anybody have an idea what my next step is? We can do a mole to mole ratio mole. if you want. Yeah. So there are three moles of electrons for every one mole of aluminum. These last two steps you can do as one step. I'm showing them as two separate ones for this one to point it out. Where did I get the three from? Or Damon and I were saying it at the same time. That was pretty awesome. Um, synchronicity. Aluminum has a plus three charge. <laughs> yeah, hopefully you learned at some point aluminum has a plus three, or you can get it. The aluminum's combined with three chlorides, so that implies aluminum must be a plus three. And then to go from moles to grams of aluminum, we use our periodic table, that number 26.98. So that's coming from the periodic table. That number, that came from the charge. 
The sky was just Faraday's constant from up here. And we can punch it in. Does that probably be faster than me finding my answer key? Well, not really. I had 3.36. It's two in the same color. So this is called unit conversions, dimensional analysis, factory label. Um, so that's how we're going to do these calculations for when it says show it in this nice flow. It is really nice. You don't have all these steps all over the place where you get lost. All right. So EMF is the amount of volts. So like numbers we were just working with. And we're going to do this problem. We're probably not going to have, you're not going to see, I know you're not going to see another one that does kilowatt hours in my class. Uh, but for any of you who pay an electricity bill, your electricity comes in kilowatt hours. And a thousand kilograms of aluminum is a lot of aluminum. It's a metric ton. But this is why the dams were built on the Columbia River, because there is a lot of bauxite in this area. And aluminum is extremely useful for making airplanes, especially when you're at war with fascist countries. Uh, and so by us building those dams, we were able to make aluminum, because in bauxite, in the minerals, it's aluminum as a plus three charge. And in the airplanes, it has to be aluminum metal. This is why you get paid now 10 cents an aluminum can, because it's actually cheaper for them to take the aluminum that's already there than to try to use the electricity to force the electrons back. Um, right before this process was figured out, they built the Washington Monument in Washington, DC. And the top of the Washington Monument is not gold and it's not platinum, it's actually aluminum because aluminum was so valuable until they figured out electrolysis and could force the electrons back into the aluminum. Aluminum is actually a really young metal. They didn't even know it was an element. Um, it's not like in any of the old like writings and stuff. Um, we didn't have an aluminum age, although I guess now is kind of. So, if you're given mass, always start with mass. So 1,000 kilograms aluminum. Periodic table is grams. So kilogram is 1,000 grams or 10 to the third if you prefer. You can use parentheses if you like. Uh, and then aluminum, 26.98 grams of aluminum is one mole of aluminum. Um, we're going to go to electrons because that's the jump. So if you want, in the next one, I will combine them. Oh, good, we're going to do another, try and draw one. So for every one mole of aluminum, there were three moles of electrons. There was this awesome book somebody gave me. It was out like 20 years ago, though. I can't remember what it's called. Um, but it's about when all the dams were built. And after World War, there was like, this whole race to build all these dams after World War II. And so a lot of dams were built unnecessarily and now they're actually getting rid of them. Um, some of them because there's no water uh, in some of these dams, which is a whole nother. All right, Faraday's constant. This time, the 96,000 is gonna go on top so that the mole of electron cancels. Right, it's all in, so the units cancel. That gets us the Coulomb. So volt is a joule per Coulomb. So we'll multiply by the 4.50 volts to one Coulomb. I'm sorry, a volt is a joule per Coulomb. I keep writing it that way. So that gets me to joules. My grams, my kilograms, all of that canceled. Um, so this is the part that's weird. You can you can just do this conversion, but I'm going to show you where that conversion comes from. Is we want a kilowatt, and so a kilowatt is going to be a kilojoule. So we need to divide by a thousand joules to one kilojoule, um, and a watt means joules per second. 
So how do we suddenly get seconds down here? Well, once a kilowatt hour. So we want this to be kilojoules. A kilowatt hour means kilojoules times hours per second. So you end up dividing by the 3,600 seconds to an hour, or these two steps combined is that conversion. Again, you're not going to see to do this again in the study set and stuff. We have enough other things to do. Um, but it's a valid question to ask because the answer you get is astronomical. Is, well, it's not astronomical, but it's quite large. It's 13,000 kilowatt hours. And I, I automatically pay my electric bill, but it's not that many kilowatt hours that I use in a month. So this is why the people at Reynolds, which is the aluminum plant up the river from us, they're actually paid to stay home when there is an issue down in California because we sell a lot of our electricity down to them. Um, so it's actually cheaper to pay them to stay at home than to send the electricity to make more aluminum. And so we can use our electricity distrib distribution differently because this process of electrolysis uses a lot of energy. That's why that problem's there. We're going to be doing these. All right. So I'm going to pause us. Um, you have a choice. You can either try one of the problem solving ones or you can try and do your half reactions. Or you can just breathe for two minutes. All right. So electrolysis, um, the cathode is the cation, which is positive. So the nickel. You're starting with ions. So split what you're starting with into the ions. The cathode means you're gaining electrons. So the nickel ion needs two electrons to get back to nickel solid. The chlorides are going back to chlorine gas and they lose two electrons. And so that's the anode. So again, the anode is always Leo, always losing electrons. And the cathode is always Ger, always gaining electrons. The difference is the cathode is negative and the anode is positive. I didn't make it up. Um, and so the positive ions are attracted to the negativity of it. Um, and it's because of plugging it in that the electrons are forced to the cathode. And so then the nickel ion is attracted to that negative of the electrode. Um, and we end up with the elements and they could do whatever they needed to. Um, but again, every year when I do this problem, I take a moment and think, I'm thankful for the dam. So as much as we want to say the environmental issues the dams have, you live in a free country. For all of the problems we have, you live in a free country because we were able to keep making planes for England and England kept having planes. Uh, Nazi Germany did not have that foresight. All right. So if you have time, start with time, 1.2 minutes, not the herb time. Not a fan of that, but it's pretty plant. Uh, you want to go to seconds. So 60 seconds to one minute. And then our amps. There are such things as milliamps, microamps. It is a metric unit. But this is just 0 0.150 coulombs per second. And then 96,500 coulombs to one electron or one mole of electron. And then we're doing nickels, so we're gonna have two electrons. So if you like, you can do two moles of electrons to the 58.69 grams of nickel. That's again from the periodic table, 58.69. And you'll get a really small, I got 3.28 milligrams. Does that somebody else get that? Maybe. Sure. Let's go with a different color for the last one. All right, the last one we're 
Solving for time, how long means time. Like how much longer is she gonna go on? Not much. Uh, so if you have mass, start with mass, 2.5 grams of zinc. Did somebody else punch that in? We can go with my answer. We're good. All right. Again, changing that metric prefix, as much as the pain in the ass it might have been a week ago, it it really it's really nice. You get rid of all the zeros, get rid of the exponent. All right. Uh, so we want to get out of the grams. And again, you can go straight. You can just go to moles and then do that extra step. Or you can go zinc uh, likes to be two. It's charge. If in doubt, go with two. Um, Aluminum is one of the few exceptions. And zinc on our periodic table is 65.37. It's a beautiful sunny day again, so I have a nice glare on my periodic table. All right, that gets us to moles of electrons, and then we'd use Faraday's constant is extremely useful. Gets us to coulombs. So it's all in the unit conversions. And then we're trying to get some time. So there's my amps, 2.12 coulombs to one second. So you have to flip the amps upside down for the unit to cancel. That gets you the seconds. You get an answer that says 3,480 seconds. So, this is like the whole thing last week where I'm like, put it in an appropriate metric unit. What do you mean? What do you mean? What I'm going to tell you here is when you solve for time, put it in an appropriate time unit. So you're going to solve in seconds. And nobody says, hey, what time's class over? When are we going to be done? I'm not going to say in 3,480 seconds. What time are you going to be here in 3,480 seconds? People are going to look at you like, never mind. So you can look at that and say, oh, it's a little bit less than an hour. So let's go to minutes. And so 58 minutes. How long until you get there? 58 minutes, right? So you can tell once you get to seconds, you figure out what unit to put it in. So it would probably say, how long? Please give your answer in the appropriate time unit. Um, if, it, if it was over, you know, like, 7,000 seconds, we would want to go to hours. All right, that's it. Any questions? So tomorrow, just make sure, right, you guys know if I can stop this. So you're either at 1130 on Tuesday, 2 o'clock, or you're in the evening group at 6. And I'll be here the half hour before each one. If you're in the 2 o'clock group, if you're waiting, uh, it just means we're still going. So I can stop.